With Barbara's birthday bash finally behind us, I figure Matthew is probably pretty famished considering there was no birthday cake or refreshments at said party. So, against my better judgment, I figured it might be worthwhile to head over to the diner and see if we can't finally have one of their amazing hamburgers. Problem is, before we can even get inside the diner, we run across a familiar figure who we definitely want to follow up on. Because as you might recall, this was Mel's accomplice from that daring daylight robbery of the diner. It does take a little bit of time for Matthew to finally recognize him. Once we do, as you can imagine, the blonde robber is not going to want to stick around. So as you can imagine, much like the stealth section that we had to deal with earlier, this chase is kind of cumbersome with the controls, but the good thing is the robber does follow a pretty set path, so it's not too difficult to chase him down. And while he does play a little bit coy, Matthew really doesn't have time for that. We do need to figure out where Mel is right now. He's still very much a person of interest in our case regarding where Emma is. Yeah, once the robber realizes he's not going to get rid of us, he decides to give us a little bit of fisticuffs payback. The good thing for us is that after that little bit of practice we had fighting the stalker, we are a little bit more proficient at fighting, and the robber doesn't really have any special techniques or any kind of new maneuvers here. I think, honestly, the one really interesting thing about this fight is that you can initiate it at quite a few different locations in town. I think one of them is pretty much a fight out in the middle of the street. And since it's still actively, like, in the map of the game, cars will just kind of drive right through the fight, not really giving any kind of care about these two random people are just having a fist fight in the middle of the road. I suppose it probably would have been too complicated to put in a system where random citizens might call the police on you if they notice you doing something illegal, but... Still really gives a feeling that all of Mazurna Falls is pretty nonplussed about everything going on around them. But having bested the blonde robber here, hopefully he is willing to spill a little bit of information about Mel. Problem is that he was only a messenger. Mel had him deliver a message over to Lorraine, which I guess kind of explains why he might have been heading over back to the diner. And just what was in that message... Well, after a little, a little threat of involving the police, the blonde robber is more willing to open up to us. And that's the fact that... Mel is waiting at a room over at the lakeside. And yes, there's obviously a very large lakeside area, but considering it was a proper noun, that means that it's more than likely the lakeside motel. And while the robber does mention that we could possibly ask Lorraine for information, instead... Hey, did you know that Matthew had something akin to The Shining and can just picture random areas of the of Mazurna Falls? Well, apparently he can now, so yeah, we're not really going to worry about trying to get information out of Lorraine. I don't think it'll really work. And also, while we were getting our little bit of Shining, the blonde robber did run away, though we don't really care about that for right now. At least gives us a place to meet Mel, though... We don't want to do that just yet. It did strike me that we really hadn't talked to Winona at any point today. It might be worth catching her up on what we have figured out. Normally, I think here we would probably be discussing 
you know, what we learned at Barbara's birthday about the, the man named Cougar that was living up at the church, the mysterious ritual that he was doing from old Native American lore. But I, th I think I ended up missing a little piece of dialogue here. Instead, they're just going over the, the whole drug angle regarding Mel and Emma and Kathy. Because I also think this is the first time that Winona's really mentioned it at all. I think you could have triggered this on a previous day, but... I think more than anything, Matthew just want to kind of reiterate... Well, he wants to reiterate what we kind of picked up from Emma's diary, which was that she was not really into the idea of doing drugs to facilitate whatever her and Kathy was doing. And while I think Matthew and Winona already know that there was another side to Emma, drug use probably was not a real big portion of that, if at all. So, more or less just a quick little pep talk with Winona to make sure that she is doing alright. And that more or less, you know, this is all pretty much Mel's fault. Yeah, well, we already kind of got the idea that Mel is somehow directly connected to Bonehead. Matthew still is very much under the assumption that, you know, Mel is the linchpin with Emma's disappearance, possibly Kathy's death or whatever happened with her out in the woods, and that his skittishness and want to run and maybe even the robbery was, you know, all in a greater connection with the crime that, that happened on that Christmas Eve. The weird thing is that if he was connected, why did he bring up the fact that he saw Emma at Bar Wolf at 10 p.m.? I mean, was that just a weak attempt to try to make an alibi for himself and say, hey, I was on the opposing side of town whenever whatever happened with Emma and Kathy happened? I mean, the sheriff still hasn't really followed up with Wolf, who runs the bar, to see whether or not he has any, you know, real information about the fact that Mel was or was not at the bar at the said time he, he mentioned, but I don't know. It just goes back to the fact that Sheriff Morgan really isn't doing that great of a job. Especially since it's pretty much up to us to follow up on clues and hopefully try to wrangle where Mel is. In this case, he is meeting Lorraine here at the Lakeside Motel. And he's not going back to the room with the blood on it, so we're not going to worry about room three. We can interact with room two, but doesn't seem like anybody's in. And the problem is that I have it on pretty good authority, especially can't, since you can't interact with room one or four, that he's got to be in here. I mean, there's nowhere else he could be. It's not like he couldn't just be answering the door, right? And yeah, I was pretty super worried that I had missed out on something here. I know he's got to be in room two, and... Oh. Yeah, I think I ended up being just a little bit too early for the event that triggers here. Because it was a bit hard to tell. That was Lorraine heading into the room. And... That seemed slightly comedic to me, but uh, we we know we now know that Lorraine is in there, which means more than likely Mel is in there as well. Can't pull the the wool over our eyes, Lorraine. We saw you in there. And it is worthwhile on Matthew's part that he is trying to reason with Lorraine to some degree. I mean, it it has been pretty evident that she's pretty much prominently in Mel's camp and wanting to support him as much as she possibly can, what with the robbery and the lying to the police and everything, but she does have to realize at some point that she could very well start to be, you know, instigated on the police's part as being an accomplice to everything Mel is doing. I mean, they might be willing to grant her some clemency if she just tells us where Mel is. And 
and she really does want to see possibly the better side of Mel and give him the benefit of the, do benefit of the doubt, but... Yeah, Matthew doesn't really have time for all that. With each passing moment, you know, Emma could be in more and more serious danger. And while it seems like we almost made some headway with Lorraine, we get a bigger break in the case here because Mel finally shows himself. Just not certain how... I guess he might not have been in the room and was just a couple feet behind us the entire time. Still, it's time for another amazing action minigame, I suppose. Hopefully you are well-oriented with your driving skills because... Yeah, we now have to chase after Mel on his sweet motorcycle. As you can imagine, even going at top speed in our VW Bug, it's going to be pretty hard to catch up to Mel. Thing is, once we do catch up to Mel, we can just give him a little nudge with our much larger vehicle. And all we have to do is do that three times to completely stop him. The good thing is that he does go on a pretty set path, much like after we were chasing after the robber previously. So it's not too difficult to, to make sure and keep up with him. I think the one caveat to keep in mind here is that as opposed to most other fights or other action set pieces in the game, if Mel does manage to get away, there is no redoing this part. He will just get away and you will pretty much lock yourself out of a number of important story events that are going to be happening after we catch it. And normally I, I've done a little bit better at this, but I just need to nudge him one more time and it does fittingly happen right next to the cemetery because we've given him a dead end in his journey. As you can imagine, Winona is probably pretty upset that we just got involved in a high-speed pursuit with a known criminal. And Nas honestly doesn't really seem to give two shits, so... Yeah, it still kind of works out for us, because we finally managed to get Mel into custody, and hopefully that means we can get some more information about the drugs and what might have happened between him, Kathy, and Emma. Just... I, I definitely feel like he's a linchpin in everything going on. And wouldn't you know it, he has definitely spilled his guts, and Sheriff Morgan has plenty of important information to give us. Also, rather strangely, instead of heading over to his office, I, I guess to not give information away to Uncle Nas or Mary Lou, instead we head over to the smoking area, where we get the full story of what happened between Mel, Emma, and Kathy the night of the 23rd. Now, as what well, we've already been, pieced to get, been able to piece together from Emma's diary, yeah, Kathy tried to requisition Mel to get some drugs. Thing is that the drugs did not directly come from Mel. Instead, Mel purchased them from Bonehead. And we can now make the assumption that the money that Bonehead was looking for from Mel was probably to pay off the drugs that he had gotten. The weird thing is that Kathy had introduced Bonehead to Mel. Seems a bit odd that... I guess Kathy would be the person to do that, and not just directly buy the drugs from Bonehead. Man, yeah, Kathy had run into the Bonehead while at, you know, Bar Wolf. And yet, yeah, I guess Kathy was just a, a little bit imposed upon by Bonehead, so she had Mel to purchase the drugs in her stead. 
There is still very much the question of what the drugs were going to be used for. I mean, outside of their hallucinogenic properties, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And yeah, it still very much seemed like whatever Kathy was trying to organize, Emma had a full hand in as well. It almost seemed like both of them were trying to work towards some common goal that, I guess, required this hallucinogen. But Mel is still very much sticking to his guns that the last time that he saw Emma was at 10 p.m., I think, walking around Cochlin's Peak. And I, it seems that while Kathy was more than happy to have him be as a, a middleman for the purchasing of the drugs, it doesn't seem like she really needed him for whatever was going on on the night of the 24th. And yeah, she mentioned something strange about the that Christmas Eve seeming like a night before a festival. So, she was trying to do something slightly festive on Christmas Eve? It really doesn't seem too out of left field, though. Yeah, it doesn't really seem like hallucinogens and Christmas really go together that much. Still, while Matthew is pretty adamant about the idea that, you know, Mel must have been there, he, he really, really wants to pin this all on Mel and, I guess, get everything over with. Yeah, Mel... Mel's... Pretty much sticking to the idea that Kathy and Emma did not want the did not want him around in the forest for whatever they were doing there. And there is still this mysterious, I guess, fourth or fifth party at this point that Kathy was meeting up with. Could it have been Bonehead? Doubtful. I mean, if Kathy wasn't willing to purchase the drugs from Bonehead, I, I don't think she would be willing to meet him out in the dark forest in the middle of the night. And the problem is that Bonehead is still a pretty elusive figure. Mel doesn't really know too much about him. And it doesn't honestly seem like anybody else in town does as well. I mean, at this point, Mel seems to be the closest person that we know of to Bonehead, and that's just because of that interaction they had with the uh, the late night cemetery meeting and the uh, the meetup after the armed robbery. So Mel still definitely seems like the most applicable person to to try to get some more info on Bonehead, especially at this point. That I mean. Mel has definitely done some illegal stuff. There's no question about that. He definitely needs to be arrested. But there's still very much the question of how much involvement he has in Kathy's death and the disappearance of Emma. And at this point, he doesn't really seem to have that much of a connection beyond just the purchasing of the drugs. Still, I'm sure after we ramped him off the road and got him imprisoned again, he's going to be more than happy to talk to us. Or not. Yeah, he's still pretty peeved at us. And as you can imagine, he's pretty confused why we why would we be why we would be coming to him to try to learn more about Bonehead. I mean, in his mind, he is talk to Sheriff Morgan as much as he would like to about Bonehead. And yep, that's his one defining feature, is the fact that he's got no hair. He's the only bald person in town, I guess? I mean, Uncle Nas is almost there, but yeah, I guess Bonehead's one defining feature is his head. Still, that does motivate Mel to, to talk a little bit more. Uh, I mean, at least in his anger, he does kind of reveal a little bit more to us.
Well, outside of the fact that he is very dangerous, Matthew already knows that because Bonehead was about to shoot him in the face. So the, the question of him being a dangerous character is not really in question. But no, the important thing that we get out of Mel here is that Bonehead was previously under the employ of Isabella. And that definitely is something very important to learn, because we already know that Isabella has a connection with Emma. More than likely, Isabella also has some connection with Kathy, considering that Kathy was at the bar pretty frequently. And that Isabella is under someone's control, and yeah, that, that definitely would have been very important to, uh, to probably tell the police. But at least he does give us that information, and it gives us a little bit more to go on. And while Mel definitely does not give any type of shit about Matthew... I think more than anything, he just doesn't want it to go back around on him that he did manage to spill out a little bit of important information. I mean, if anything, Mel does seem sincerely scared of whoever these people are that are connected with Bonehead. And there's still very much the question about who this shadowy outside organization is. Just... We're not going to be able to get any more information out of Mel here. So instead, yeah, I think it's time we go catch up with Isabella at Bar Wolf. Now, a part of me thinks that it just might be a bit too early for the bar to be as hopping as it normally is. Thing is that something else does seem to be missing from the bar, and that's the bodyguard that is normally guarding the door over there. My assumption is that if there's no bodyguard, that could also mean that there's no Isabella here. Now, while it's not the best idea to be sitting at a bar as a underage teen while the only sheriff in town is nearby, we do need to get some information out of Wolf here. does seem our suspicions do pay off. She is feeling, I guess, exhausted or under the weather, so she is not going to be singing tonight. And it does make sense that she is probably back at the apartment, apartment building where she lives. Thing is, though, that by questioning Wolf here, he does kind of wonder a little bit why this teenage boy is looking for the hot singing sung the singing siren of the uh, the bar here and as we already know Matthew is a completely innocent soul so he's not trying to do anything untoward it's just wolf does have a legitimate reason to be concerned because well we we did peep in on her and stalker but there's also that other real stalker that's stalking her It does seem, though, that the, the bodyguard that did knock us out did kind of reveal the fact that we were at Isabella's apartment that night. Probably doesn't look the best for us, but I don't know. As far as we know, Wolf never leaves the bar here, so I don't think we're in any real danger. Still, it does appear that gentleman that knocked us out is not only her bodyguard, but her driver, which means that Bonehead is no longer her driver. And Wolf does know about him, at least in passing. I mean, he's he's seen the angry ball gentleman. Still, it does... I do kind of get the impression that he is not totally willing to try to set up a meeting for us between, you know, us and Bonehead. Namely for the fact that, much like Matthew, or much like Mel, he, he knows that Bonehead is not someone that we should be getting involved with. He is not uh, a totally on the up-and-up character. And yet again, 
I mean, he already tried to shoot Matthew in the face, so we don't... I mean, it's not like we need to be super reminded of this, but... Still, it is good to know that Bonehead is, you know, gotten under enough people's skin in town that he definitely, he definitely has a reputation about him. And yet again, there's this mention of a, a shadowy outside organization that even Wolf also knows about. Problem is, there's, you know, he's not going to be willing to to put himself in jeopardy to, to give Matthew here any additional information, so... Well, we still need to follow up with Isabella, so that means that we are going to visit her back at the old homestead in the apartment known as The Ruins. And as you can imagine, I do get a little bit turned around here. Hard to tell one dilapidated door from another. But Matthew uses his shining yet again to psychically figure out that there doesn't seem to be anybody inside Isabella's apartment. And since it is so late, I think Uncle Na should be in. Maybe he has managed to see something while he's uh, he's been at home. So Matthew, very gingerly and very honestly, asks if, you know, Nas has seen Isabella anytime recently. As you can imagine, Nas's first impression is that we are still chasing skirts, I'm trying to get in with uh, the lovely ladies of the town. It's not the case, though. We have more important things to delve into than, than our teenage hormones. Well, Nas has not seen Isabella any time recently, and even more strangely, I guess, to him is the fact he hasn't seen anybody coming in and out of her apartment, such as the normal allotment of shady guys. Now, Matthew is very concerned about her, and... More than likely her connection still with, you know, Emma and the drug trade and Bonehead. And Nas and his infinite adult wisdom. Yeah, he decides to tell us that we should probably just sneak into her apartment. Do a little... A little B&E, I guess. And what you know it, the building is pretty old and rickety. There are air ducts just leading between all the different apartments, so we can technically maybe use the adjacent empty apartment to get inside of a room. And yeah, is breaking and entering okay to do? Well, of fucking course not, Matthew. It's, it's very illegal. But it's only illegal if you get caught. Says Uncle Nas with a, a wink and a touch of his nose. So yeah, another good adult role model in town. I mean, we had uh, we had the good doctor tell us that we should stalk a woman, and now Uncle Nas says, "Well, if a woman won't let you in, just go ahead and break into her apartment." So I fully tell I fully recommend people do not follow Matthew's example here. Do not ever stalk people. Do not ever break into people's apartments. And yeah, I guess whenever an apartment is not in use, it just becomes a storage area. And yeah, there's our entrance up into the air ducts, just a little bit out of Matthew's reach. But there is this one movable box we can use as a little footstep, footstool. As you can imagine, though, it is particularly dark up there. 
And this is where it's very important that you uh, made sure to pick up that lighter from the general store. Because if you do not have that lighter in your inventory, you cannot go up here and you are blocked from ver some very important story-related items. Now that we are in the air ducts though, oh man, this is where the graphics of the game really come into question and yeah, the, the air ducts do not do the game any favor any favors in re in regards to the graphics, in regards to the controls. It is it is a nightmare being up here. First and foremost, there is no good way to navigate up here. Some of the walls are just razor thin to the point of being non-existent if you look at certain angles. There are just random pipes everywhere. And even though it should be a very short distance from, you know, one apartment over to the other, it is nigh on labyrinthian up here for poor Matthew. I'd say the one saving grace about being up here is that they do stop the, the active timer going on in the game. So you're not, you know, going to miss important story-related timed elements while up here. I do kind of picture it that, you know, if you do stay up here for too long, that at some point Matthew will just keel over dead from starvation and then, you know, some other active adventurer looking for poor Isabella will stumble across his skeleton with a lighter just chilling up here. Also, you might be wondering just where or what we're trying to actively look for to to give us an exit out of this air duct labyrinth and I wish I could give you a good indication uh, I think looking at the uh, subtitlers guide they mentioned like a, a ray of light or a lighter air area but for the life of me I do not see it but hey we are finally there yep did you see where we were supposed to exit I honestly didn't. Still, for all of our hard work, we do manage to break into Isabella's apartment. Problem is that it is in quite a state of disarray. Someone has turned it upside down looking for something. Good thing for us is that the only real thing we have of interest in here, outside the missing Isabella, is this strange picture of a cabin out in the woods. Well, maybe not Barrow's Woods, maybe just some other nearby wooded area. So I don't think that's the cabin where we fought and killed the bear. Still, since Isabella isn't in here, I guess the, the trail on that end is pretty much run cold, which is not great for us. Just as it seems that the trail had died off, fate just smacks us right in the face and we give, well, what I think turns out to be our third chase of this video. good thing for us is that we didn't have to control with all those weird camera angles. We do have to be a little bit on our toes though, because once we actually get outside of the apartments proper, we are now back in control and we have to quickly catch the stalker here. As far as I can tell though, uh, you can only really catch people at very set points in the map, like I was just mashing the interaction button there and he was just shoving me along. But yeah, now it's time to figure out what the stalker did with poor Isabella. Why, why he was trying to get into her apartment outside the, the obvious reasons. 
Now, while he does try to play the, the tough guy, I think he does recall the fact that we totally kicked his ass slash almost, you know, got our ass kicked as well back at Bar Wolf. And yeah, through a, a little expert manhandling and, well, not being actively officers of the law so we can just beat the hell out of people, we are able to get some information out of the stalker. Namely the fact that he is just looking for Isabella as well. I mean, outside of his, you know, possibly normal, natural, pervy behavior. I guess he was just heading to her apartment because he has not seen her at all. I mean, she, grant she performed last night, but yeah, she wasn't around at all tonight. And being her number one desperate fan, he definitely wants to know where she is. Now, Matthew knows that being uh, a stalker of a person, he probably knows some outside-of-the-way places that Isabella might show up. And while he, he's not super happy about us confusing number one fan with stalker, yeah, he, he does have some ideas of some odd places that Isabella has been known to show up around town. Namely the fact that he has seen her coming out of the junkyard before. And your first question might be is, there's a junkyard in Mazerna Falls? Well, it does work out. Matthew does know just exactly where it happens to be. It just is a bit of a mystery why the singer at a bar would happen to go to the junkyard. I guess she might be looking for a spare part for her car or something, but yeah, seems a bit out of the way. And as we don't actively know where the junkyard is, Matthew does pull out his shining yet again to give us a clue. Not, not a great clue, but it, it still does work out for us. Though, yet again, in his shining state, Matthew did lose another important suspect. It, it's okay, though. I mean, we at least know another place to check for Isabella. And, now that Matthew remembered the junkyard, it's now marked on our map. And, in fact, I think it is the final location that's available to us in Mazerna Fall. So, at this point, we have pretty much every possible location I think we can go to in the game. So... Without further ado, it's time to head over to the junkyard and see if we can't find some more ideas about where Isabella is. Yeah, I think we've passed by this little fenced-off area here a couple times, but it's mostly seemed pretty innocuous and... and yeah, I, it didn't even seem like a location we could visit. Inside, though, it's pretty much what you would expect of a junkyard, though I get an almost creepy vibe, or vibe off of it. I mean, in essence, it's pretty much a car graveyard, and with the wind whistling through the air and the seemingly empty nature of this place, makes you wonder even more why Isabella would have headed here. Now, the school bus really drew my attention because it seems like the only place we can get into, and... It seems like my suspicions really paid off. There's something scrawled on the floor there. I can't really make out in the, uh, the low resolution of the game, but... It seems to be possibly written blood. And while there's no Isabella in here, there seems to be even more blood here by the front seat. And when 
whenever you are looking for a missing person, and instead you find a whole lot of blood and possibly a bloody message, that never feels like a good sign. Not to mention, in addition to the blood around the seat, there is something rather peculiar about the seat itself. Because if we lift it up, which is a bit odd that we can do, but if you've ever been on a bus, you know that there is some handicapped seating at the front of buses that allows wheelchairs to be there. Sadly, that doesn't seem to be the purpose of lifting up the seat. Instead, it seems to be housing a metric ton of the hallucinogenic, dr hallucinogenic drug Epoch. Is this why Isabella was coming to the junkyard? To, to get more Epoch to pawn off to the kids of Mazerna Falls? Or was this some closer connection that she and Bonehead had? Maybe, maybe she was that shadowy figure controlling Bonehead. Either way, we need to go report this to Sheriff Morgan as quick as we can. With one small problem. Yeah, pretty much the cornerstone of any junkyard is the junkyard dog. And this one is just as ravenous and crazed as you might think of any guard dog that's guarding a bunch of junked cars. And yep, yeah, welcome to one of the most annoying mini-games in the entire, entire video game. It's, uh, it's difficult to control. The dog will kill you in about four hits, one of which it will get off pretty much immediately. And yet, yeah, while I did show the one success, trust me when I say that I spent about 15 solid minutes trying to get away from that stupid dog. Still, for all of our hard work, we managed to find a whole lot of drugs. And we found another very important clue that we led Sheriff Morgan to while he was, I'm gonna say, playing Jenga. Problem is, as you can imagine, Matthew just does not can't get the kind of respect that he is absolutely due for solving everything in this case so far. And in fact, we run into what I assume to be the brother of Deputy Roadblock who was blocking our entrance into the forest before, in the form of, I don't know, Sergeant Gatekeeper here. And yeah, he is really not willing to let random teenager in the nighttime into the junkyard. And yeah, Matthew is definitely trying to throw around his non-existent clout here to, to try to make his way in. That's right, he is THE Matthew Williams that you've heard about on all the town bulletin boards. Sadly, Deputy Gatekeeper here does not care at all. But that works out for us, because through our hard work with Sheriff Morgan and that item we unlocked, we can just flash our fancy badge and get right in. Yeah, that's right. I got a gold star from the Sheriff, and that means that I'm the best junior detective in all of Mazerna Falls. Problem is, that does not make us a detective, as Sheriff Morgan already pointed out, so it doesn't really get us any kind of headway with getting back into the junkyard. Not even a, a little bit of sugar sweetness will get Matthew inside. Instead, we have to be saved by our knight in shining armor. Good old Deputy Hudson, who's done absolutely nothing throughout the course of the game. At least he knows, or at least has some passing knowledge, that we have been a pretty crucial part in the entire investigation. 
And while it's against probably protocol and better judgment, he does put deputy gatekeeper in his place and says, he's got a badge, that means you should let him in. And believe it or not, while this seems like a, a fairly just comedic little side plot here, it is very important that you do make sure to get back into the junkyard, because you might miss out on some very important plot information that Sheriff Morgan has to give us. As you can, as you can probably imagine though, he is pretty surprised we were able to get back into the crime scene. He has a good old belly laugh about the fact that uh, we, we used uh, the item he gave us to fake our way into a crime scene. Which leaves me even more of the fact that Sheriff Morgan is not a good cop. He has not followed up on so many leads. He has not questioned half the people that we have. He, I don't know. I'm assuming that it's... Maybe a position he won in a lottery or out of a, a cereal box, but it, I don't know, it's fine. Either way, we give him some of the important information we've been able to collect, namely that the reason we came to the junkyard in the middle of the night is definitely not because we broke and entered into a person's apartment, but instead because we assaulted and chased down somebody and figured out that Isabella would be here. And while Sheriff Morgan doesn't really think that Isabella is directly selling the drugs, she definitely has some connection to it. And that's why it does make a lot of sense that if we find her, we can probably find more information about Bonehead, especially considering now that we know that Bonehead and Isabella did have some measure of a past together. Yeah, Bonehead is still very much the person of interest that we are wanting to track down with all this. Thing is, though, that he is a slippery character. As we already kind of covered, not very many people know him. We ha we honestly have no idea where he could be in town, considering we've covered pretty much everywhere. Also, strangely enough, the junkyard is shown to be owned by Dennis Aston, Mel's father. And while it isn't outside the realm of... I guess reasonability that the rich guy who owns all the real estate in town would also own this junkyard. I don't know, it does kind of make him a little bit suspicious. I mean, he also owned the the workers' lodging. And there was that little bit of information we, we got from the phone call with Uncle Nas that, you know, Dennis was also poking around the apartment building. So Matthew does kind of make the partial assumption that, you know, Dennis could have some connection with the drug trade and that he could be that shadowy outside force controlling Bonehead and Isabella and in turn, you know, Mel to some degree. But it's also not outside the realm of possibility that, you know, he just could not know that there was some drug trade going on on one of his many parcels of land. Still, we're going to leave it up to the sheriff and uh, Hudson here to do a little bit of questioning of Dennis tomorrow. And sadly, we do lose our badge, but this was pretty much the only reason we needed it, to make sure to get in here and get this additional information about Dennis and trying to find more about Bonehead. And just like that, we now roll into, I think, day five. We've done a whole lot today. We've had a, some birthday fun, got mauled by a dog, and yeah, hopefully tomorrow you will join me as we continue our investigation in Mazerna Falls. Mm -hmm.